Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's great to be here in Chapel Hill on this beautiful spring morning. Not quite as nice as Asheville, but <laughs> pretty nice. So thank you all for being here. I'd like to uh, remind everyone at this time to turn their cell phones off, if they would, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Knott to give the invocation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Very nice to be with you. Uh, I was reading in uh, the Gospel of Luke, and I came across a scene which I thought might be appropriate to what we're doing here. And it is, of course, the familiar passage of Jesus as a boy at the time of the Passover. If you recall, uh, in verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year for the feast of the Passover. And they were there for several days, and when the feast was completed, they left thinking that Jesus, being a rambunctious 12-year-old, was somewhere around, but he wasn't. And they noticed that he was missing, and they turned around to go back and look for him. Remember the story? And the verse that struck me was verse 46. It says, and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And as I thought of that, here is a young person sitting with the older and learned doctors, <coughs> listening and hearing what they had to say and at the appropriate time asking questions. And I thought, is that not a beautiful picture of what it is we are gathered here to do? To provide opportunities for our young people to sit with the doctors and to listen to their wisdom and to ask them questions. When they discussed further with him, he said, why did you have trouble finding me? Did you not know I had to be about my father's business? Which tells me this exercise of sitting with the doctors and listening is in fact the father's business. So what we are doing seems to be a worthwhile endeavor. For those who would care to, you may join me in prayer. Almighty God, we beseech thee with thy gracious favor to behold our universities, colleges, and schools, and specifically our beloved University of North Carolina that knowledge may be increased among us and all good learning flourish and abound. Bless all who teach, bless all who learn, and grant that in humility of heart that they and we may ever look unto thee who art the foundation of all wisdom through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe. <coughs> Secretary Perry, will you please call the roll? Chairman Bissett. Here. Vice Chairman Aiken. Here. Ms. Burris Floyd. Here. Mr. Byers. Here. Mr. Davenport. Here. Mrs. Gage. Here. Mr. Goolsby. Here. Mr. Granger. Here. Mr. Hinton. Here. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes, Mr. Hood. Here. Mr. King. Here. Mr. Knott. Here. Mr. Cotus. Here. Mr. Lampy. Here. Mr. Long. Here. Mrs. McNeil. Here. 
Ms. Maxwell. Here. Mr. Mitchell, Alex Mitchell. Mr. Alex Mitchell. Mr. Champ Mitchell. Here. Mrs. Nelson. Here. Mr. Parrish. Here. Mr. Pickett. Here. Mr. Powers. Here. Mr. Rippey. Here. Mr. Sloan. Here. Mr. Smith. Here. Mr. Souza. Here. Mr. Siwasink. Mr. Siwasink. Mr. Webb. Here. Mrs. Wiley. Here. Mr. Williford. Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Dr. Perry. The State Ethics Act took effect on January 1, 2007, and all of the voting members of the Board of Governors are covered by the Act. Under the Act, you have a duty to avoid conflicts of interest and appearances of conflicts. Looking at the agenda for today's meeting, does anyone know that you have a conflict of interest or an interest that would give rise to the appearance of a conflict of interest? If so, let me know now. Yes, Mr. Uh, Long. Mr. Chairman, 7E on the agenda regarding North Carolina Central. Okay. Chairman, 7E as well. Thank you both. Anything, uh, anything further? Before we begin the business portion of the meeting, I'd like to remind everyone that our la at our last meeting, we set expectations for conduct at the meetings of the Board of Governors. We ask that those attending today remain respectful of fellow attendees and the board. Those attending an official meeting may not engage in conduct that disrupts board business or interferes with the rights of others to observe and listen to the proceedings. An individual who violates these standards will be asked to leave the meeting. Failure to promptly end the disruptive conduct or voluntary or voluntary depart may result in removal from the meeting room. So thank you. I hope we'll all be respectful of each other uh, at our meeting today. Uh, I would like to just make a couple of comments at this point uh, about this week and uh, uh, our, our proposed campus meeting in Asheville. You know, we meet at different campuses uh, from time to time because it allows our board members to meet students, faculty, and staff at our various campuses to see firsthand the incredible work that is taking place at those institutions. It also allows faculty, staff, and students at those institutions to interact with board members and talk to us about the specific problems they may be having at their locality or their needs. So we think this is a, a, a very uh, important part of what we do, and I've, I've learned more about the system from our visits to the different campuses than I think just about anything else. Now I noticed that one uh, protest leader at UNC Asheville indicated that they had scared us away. Now, fortunately, I can tell you that that is not the case. We moved our meeting because of the great respect we have for Chancellor Grant and the UNC Asheville community. And I doubt that that person would understand the concept of respect, and I hope that she also would understand how civil d discourse and discussions should take place in a democracy like ours. So, I'm, I'm from Asheville, I love Chapel Hill, but I wish we were in Asheville today. We cannot be there, but Chancellor Grant, I can assure you, we will be back to Asheville. Uh, so unfortunately, we were not able to hold our meeting at UNC Asheville as originally planned, but I'd like to invite Chancellor Grant to the podium for a few remarks to tell us what we missed this week in not being at her beautiful campus. Thank you, Chancellor Grant. Thank you, Lou. Um, so we brought a little bit of Asheville to you. 
Um, and you have uh, your travel mugs because you will come and see us, and then you can be, be fueled up for the road. So what I'm going to show you is just a little clip of Asheville to get uh, a little taste of what you missed, and then I have a few words before we get back to the meeting. But first, I want to just thank um, President Spellings and her incredible team at General Administration for helping us to work on making a shift that felt very important to do. Margaret, we had great support from your, you and your teammates, and we appreciate the scramble. Um, and we appreciate being here. I think the last time I spoke behind a podium at Chapel Hill, it was when I was announced. Um, so this is an equally momentous day. I hope to, you know, um, Carol, thanks for, uh, for letting me speak behind one of your podiums at Chapel Hill. I appreciate it. So we have a little clip that we want to show you, and then I have a few words uh, to just share with you. Um, the only thing that we're missing from Asheville is so imagine yourself in the beautiful mountains. Imagine yourself where there's all kinds of incredible arts and, and, and food, and of course it's Asheville, so great craft beer, um, and a few good golf courses. But in the middle of it is this incredible liberal arts university, one of your schools. Um, what I like to say, uh, the jewel and the crown of, of the university system. So let's show you a little bit about that, and then I'll, I'll just share a little bit more.
So that's us, and it's a pretty good place. So, so thank you, and it is, it is a wonderful institution with, that does transformational education. So a couple of things I just want to share uh, with you, and that thank you was for all of you. That thank you was for supporting our institution and being champions of our institution. Um, I had the opportunity a few weeks ago to be part of the Emerging Institutes Forum, where I got to share the stage with John Scavala, the Secretary of Commerce, and Jack Cecil, and talk about the liberal arts education. And one of the things that we talked about is that it is no, it's not an either-or proposition that when we talk about STEM education, we must also talk about the liberal arts, that it's not either or, it has to be both. So a couple of things I just want to share with you about what we're doing and how we prepare our students. And you saw those pictures up there where there was a large scale event, a room filled with lots of people. Well, that was the National Conference of Undergraduate Research that we just hosted, where we began, we were the founders of that 30 years ago at UNC Asheville, when a few faculty members had an idea and they said, let's see what would happen if we put out a call for people to come and do research. 400 people showed up. 30 years later, 4,000 people showed up. And we had, a, we had four days of incredible research. During that time, we also had the opportunity during NCUR, so appropriately at this 30th anniversary celebration, to announce a $1.5 million gift to the grant to the university to support our scholars in biochem, medicinal chemistry, and biomedical programs. And that will help take the burden off of our students financially and create a pipeline for postdocs that we're working to create and bring to the university. University. So exciting work happening. You saw Sally Wasileski in the video. Sally is one of yours. You selected Sally this year as the Board of Governors Teacher Excellence Award. You will meet Sally, some of you, at commencement. She is phenomenal and she's in the heart of this GSK project that we're doing. The other piece you may have seen, you saw somebody pouring metals that said metal pour. We were going to show you that. We were going to, you know, kind of keep you away a little back because it can be a little dangerous. But in the middle of that is work that we're doing in partnership with our engineering program, our sculpture program, our computer science program, where we're teaching students how to think, how to solve problems, how to ask questions, and then how to create uh, a design and work together in teams to address a complex issue. So students have been working on creating tools to help support people with disabilities. And by working together, they're not only able to take the engineering behind it, but bring art into it to create something beautiful and useful and functional. And, and what we're doing now is we're taking that work off campus, and we will show you, because you will come, you've got your travel mugs, and is, um, we will take you to something called the River Arts Makers Project that we are going to be opening in August. And it's down at the beginning of the River Arts District. It's an old warehouse building where we're creating what is going to be um, a, a, a lab that will be the envy of some of my friends at NC State and beyond. And it's going to be a place where you can experiment. And in it will be our, our sculpture program, our <coughs> art program, glass blowing, engineering. That's been funded by Duke Energy, by the Wingate Foundation, and you will find this hard to believe we were able to actually pick Randy's pocket and get NC State to contribute some money to that. So Randy, thank you very much. Did you know that? I'm not sure. <laughs> But um, again, where we're partnering with one of our sister institutions, which is so important to bring this education across the state. We're also, and we had a chance to bring President Spellings there, which I'm so delighted we had the chance to show her the work that we're doing at the Center for Craft, Creativity, and Design. Another privately funded partnership where we're creating something right down in the heart of Asheville called The Hive, which is the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship, a partnership between UNC Asheville the art community, so students and local entrepreneurs can take an idea from concept to bringing it to market, right downtown, and that's some of the work that we're doing. And then lastly, I want to finish up, and just um, one, of the, one of the students in the video you heard from was one of our Chatori Sh Major, who was the MVP of the Big South Conference. And this year, we had two of our teams head into the NCAAs at the same time. It was only the second time in the history of the Big South Conference that any school had sent two teams at the same time, and we did it, your liberal arts university. Um, and what it was was it showed what can happen when we're investing in our students and doing the very best. And one of the students on the women's basketball team, not only at the same time was her team in the championship, she was also in the school play. And so where else can you have a student 
who was being who was working with her faculty and she had a monologue. It was a play about Anna DeVere Smith's work after the LA riots, where she had a monologue on a Friday night and a championship game the next day. That happened at UNC Asheville, and I look forward to having the opportunity to share it with you. I thank you on behalf of the campus for your incredible support, your leadership. Um, and I look forward to having a chance to welcome you to the hills of Western North Carolina and to your liberal arts university. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor Grant. I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes for the open session of the meeting of Friday, March 4th, 2016. So moved. Uh, but let me just say one more thing here now. This, you're fast. Uh, the draft minutes you received have been edited to correct uh, a motion by Mr. Cotis, and I think you have, uh, you have that corrected uh, page in your, in your folders. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. I will now recognize President Spellings for her report. <laughs> Good morning, all. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. As many of you know, we're taking steps to make the meetings of this Board of Governors more accessible and more transparent to the citizens of this state. And I'm happy to report that uh, this meeting is being streamed online. And so welcome to everyone out there in TV land. We'll continue that for future meetings as well. And we're also preparing for our first public comment session with the Board, which will take place at the May meeting. As has been said, our meeting today was originally scheduled to take place at UNC Asheville, and I'm sorry you all didn't go, but I went without you. And thank you, Mary, for the terrific hospitality. It was a wonderful place. As, as you've said, this public liberal arts college is really a tr <clears throat> true mark of distinction in this system and one of the many ways that sets us apart from others around the country. After visiting both UNC Asheville and Appalachian this week, my campus tour is more than half complete, and it has been a real thrill to listen to students, faculty, staff, and community leaders about what makes them proud of their institutions, what issues they think are most important, and where they think we have work to do. And I'm looking forward next week to visiting Elizabeth City State, North Carolina State University, and UNC Wilmington for the second time, I might add. It seems strange to call something that's so exhausting and so energizing uh, those terms at the same time, but that's exactly what my tour has been. And I can think of really no better use of the first days in office than to go see these places, meet the people who are so proud and so benefited by them. It's impossible uh, to really convey the full breadth of that experience in a few words, but, but I will try. Uh, it's been a real window into the dedication of campus leaders, of faculty that are so brilliant and inspiring, and the intellect, energy, and creativity of our students, which of course continues to be why we're here. It's often said that we live in an age of anxiety, but if you were with me meeting young people in this state, uh, you wouldn't have any, any anxiety about the future. Let me begin by complimenting the terrific work this board has done in hiring an incredible set of chancellors, talented, competent, capable, compassionate, wonderful leaders. I want to talk about a few of them that I've met along the way. Phil Dubois and Charlotte can tell you pretty much how many bricks are in the building off the top of your head. James Anderson straightened about three people's ties as we traveled around the campus when his attention to and what do we do? Stand and, up like that. HBCUs are under attack. I'm, I'm going to gonna have to ask Stand you. I'm going to have to ask you to abide by our rules, or you, you will be removed from the room. You can't stop the revolution. 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 We can't stop the revolution. We can't stop the revolution. We. Mr. Chairman, how long do we have to tolerate this? Our officers, Mr. Ware, are, are taking care of this. You can't stop the revolution. You can't stop the revolution. Shut it down. If they don't get it, shut it down. If we don't get it, shut it down. If you continue, 
We're going to recess the meeting and you're going to be removed from the room. Shut it down. 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 The meeting, the meeting will be recessed while the room is cleared. Hey, hey. Marcus Bellis has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Marcus Bellis has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Marcus Bellis has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Marcus Bellis has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Marcus Bellis has got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Marcus Bellis has got to go. Hey, hey. When children's students are under attack, what do we do? Stand up like that. When children's students are under attack, what do we do? Stand up like that. It was until you closed it. If you want to leave the room, leave the room now. Your choice, but you got to make an effort. Will other students be able to access the Can I get a rest thing, please? Will other students be able to access the space? I don't know. The room is going to be reopened for public. I'm just telling you to get the hell out. One, two, three. Fuck the BLG. One, really? two, three. Really? Fuck the BLG. Fuck the BLG.
that's a guy. Bill, that is just a that. I will not leave a room. <laughs> I'm an eyewitness. Now we've got we've got to talk about this. Now. I will not leave. Are we arresting these people. Uh, we should. Uh, they we should. Uh, they broke the law. We should. If they broke the law, it's against the law to disrupt the public meeting. It's against the law. And we're subsidizing these people. Um, and look at right. Again. Have you met these young people? 
Hey, I just want to thank you again for being here. How could I forget you? Oh my God, are you kidding me? I just want to thank you again. Okay, thank you all uh, very much. I'm sorry for that. We're all sorry for that. It's a, uh, it's an incredibly disappointing and uh, sad event for me, and I know for everybody in this room. Uh, I do want to thank uh, the officers who are helping us. I think uh, they did a great job in uh, in handling this situation and uh, and getting us back into our agenda. So, so thank you guys very much. We really appreciate it. Okay, now I'm going to recognize President Spellings again. Thank you, Let, let me say one last thing. They're, they're going to try to move the group back far enough from the windows, but they don't have a, they really can't get them too far back, so we may have to deal with a little bit of noise, which we have done before and can do very well. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Lou. Uh, and thank you uh, to the law enforcement officers. I've been getting to know them uh, as I've traveled the state. <laughs> and they're, a, they're a barrel of laughs, really, they are. <laughs> so anyway, what I was saying was basically a brag fest on the chancellors of this system who deserve our confidence and our support in every single way. And I'm, I'm thrilled to have colleagues like this, and I want to talk about the important role that they played uh, in the March bond campaign. Uh, without them, I'm not sure we would have been as successful as we were. Of course, I'm grateful to all of you, and it was a great moment. And I think, you know, really suggests something that we don't reflect on enough, and that is that the vast, vast majority of the people of this state very much support our work. Uh, and, and we should be, uh, take, take comfort, I think, in that. As, uh, as you know, we've been, in addition to touring around, working on making sure that general administration functions as, as well as it possibly can. And one of the key recommendations of the BC re BCG report is to really uh, elevate the role that our chancellors play in, in working with us and in developing policies. Uh, I've been thrilled to get to know faculty and staff uh, who are obviously schooled in their own disciplines, but also I hear words like, we're a family, we care about each other, things like that at every turn. Um, our highest priority then, uh, accordingly, in the legislative session must be to provide the proper compensation to staff and faculty. I know that's how the board feels. We'll be talking about that later today, but we really must uh, secure a raise for these great public servants. I believe we're at a tipping point. We're in a very competitive environment. We cannot run excellent institutions without excellent people. Uh, we also have the, the opportunity to uh, do additional work around our goals and priorities. And uh, I, I think sometimes we've gotten a little uh, ensnared in, in regulation and red tape at the state level that keeps us from serving students uh, effectively. So we need to get the tools and conditions right so that our system is well aligned to meet strategic goals. 
I don't have to tell you that House Bill 2 has raised concerns as I've traveled around the state, and not just for the specifics of the law, but for the climate and culture that it suggests to some and the consequences of it in the aftermath of the passage. The chancellors tell me that we are at risk of losing great students and faculty and potential business partners and philanthropic support. And I know, like you, we all believe that our universities must be welcoming places for all. It's a core value of this institution and an absolute necessity if we want North Carolina to sustain the educational excellence and leadership that we so treasure. As a state agency, of course, this university and its officers are expected and will follow HB2 and every other law of this state, as I made clear in my guidance memo last week. As I've traveled, and Robin, you'll, you'll witness this, one of the best comments I've heard at UNC Pembroke was, we don't have to stage a diversity photo here. It just is. And that's really, really true. Over the past few weeks, I've met with countless students who are the, who are the first in their families to attend college, students who are balancing work and school and family life, students who are volunteering their time to mentor and tutor their peers. And I'm in awe of some of the barriers that these young people have overcome to pursue an education. Our students have ideas that go far beyond anything we can often conceive. They have ideas about energy efficiency, business development, and teaching. And there's very little in our world that our students are not at work on, about. As I've traveled, as you have seen, I've been met by protests on, on some of the campuses. But I really do welcome and appreciate that students have been very respectful as I've traveled. Free speech and differing viewpoints are hallmarks of our academic culture and celebrated aspects of American character. Public campuses and forums like this must be places where all voices are welcomed, heard, and respected, including ours. As one faculty member at U ECU pointed out, educating students about democratic argument and civic engagement are key parts of this enterprise. But engagement means more than just making your own voice heard. It means listening to the protesters who've devoted their time and energy to criticizing me. I say, I hear you. And what I ask in return is that you hear from me and from this board. There's great work happening on our campuses, and I've been using my visits as an opportunity to celebrate and draw attention to that work. I've been listening to students and faculty and advocating for them. Too often, the loudest voices on all sides have served to distract us from the mission rather than to elevate it, which I think is regrettable. The level of community support at each of these campuses has been one of the most striking aspects as I've traveled everywhere I've gone. I've heard variations on this theme. I simply couldn't imagine Western North Carolina, Robeson County, the Triad, the Charlotte Metro area, fill in the blank, any region without these campuses. They are mighty engines, as is said, for the economic, cultural, and civic life of these communities. At Fayetteville State, a campus trustee told me about attending evening classes when he was a young man based at Fort Bragg earning a long coveted college <laughs> degree because FSU professors were willing to work extra hours to serve men and women in uniform. At ECU, I met with doctors and nurses who described what it means for an underserved region of the state to have quality medical care available in, the, in those communities. Sharing stories like these along with rigorous data and research about the value of the UNC system is going to be one of our most important tasks in the days and months ahead. As I keep telling staff, faculty, and students on each of our campuses, I am here to serve as your chief advocate and spokesperson for your work. Doing that effectively is going to require some changes in the way that general administration is structured, and I've been discussing that throughout our, our strategic review. The process is now complete, and we have announced a new organizational structure, as I shared with you last week. I'm excited to continue to build a strong team at general administration to advance our collective success for the students we serve and the citizens of this state. And I look forward to finalizing an organizational structure that supports the strategic priorities that emerged from our assessment. As a reminder, those five themes are, number one, access. Number two, affordability. Three, student success. Four, economic impact. And five, excellent and diverse institutions. I'm confident this restructuring will strengthen general administration's core responsibilities 
and we have an opportunity to more clearly define and perhaps enhance our approach to many areas, including technology-based learning as proposed in the BCG report. As a result, I will create a small work group informed by independent external experts to study the issue in greater depth over the next several months and provide me with recommendations not only on the optimal organizational placement for this function, but more importantly, for how we define expectations, maximize the tech platforms, and track progress and measure success. BCG has also identified a clear need to bring our chancellors and campus leaders more fully into planning and decision making, and I look forward to drawing on their expertise as well. They further emphasize the need to draw on this board for, of governors for strategic guidance and high-level <coughs> thinking. With regard to the recodification, as I like to call it, uh, of some of the policies of the board, four of our standing committees have started work on a policy review project, and over the next several months, we will address personnel delegation, financial policies, and reporting. This will help all of us focus on the bigger picture. You all have busy lives, important responsibilities, and we need you to use you on the most high value ways. Much of that effort in the coming year will center on a new strategic planning process. As many of you have noted, our time is right to look at our strategic priorities and where we need to go as a system. Chairman Lou Bissett and Champ Mitchell have already reached out to all of you about the work of the renamed Strategic Planning Committee, which will begin next month and extend through year end so that we'll be ready for the legislative session in 2017. Your voices and ideas will be crucial to that process and I am genuinely excited for the chance to work with all of you, with the faculty, staff, and campus leaders in securing the University of North Carolina as the nation's leader in public higher education. We will make some important strides in this direction this month, I hope, as the legislature returns for the short session. As I said, faculty and staff pay is at the top of our priority list. On every campus I hear it, and I will go and work with the legislature, and I hope we will be successful. And evidenced by the discussion of the Program Evaluation Division Committee earlier this week, I'm convinced that more convinced than ever that we need investments in technology and data analytics to help boost student success. I'm hopeful that we'll lift the fundraising cap, which will allow us to continue cultivating private support for the university, increase donor support, relieves pressure on other funding sources, most critically, tuition and fees, which helps students and families. All of that means sharing stories of the impact our students are having in the world, and I'm grateful to wrap up my remarks on that note. With us this morning are winners of the 2016 UNC Social Entrepreneurship Competition, once again hosted at North Carolina a and Thank you, Harold. Now in its fourth year, the Entrepreneurship Competition brings together student leaders from every single campus, 47 teams in total this year, to tackle real-world problems in this state. More than 400 students, faculty, and staff, community, and business leaders took part. Their ideas and business plans were judged by a panel of state leaders, including Rodney Hood, Marty Cotis, Pearl Burris Floyd, and Laura Wiley. Thank you all for your participation. And the winners won seed money, courtesy of our sponsor, J.P. Morgan Chase, to help launch their innovations. First, we'll hear from Francisco Koch and Ben Fawcett, who took top prize in the undergraduate competition as high school students. They're from North Carolina School of Science and Math, surely one of the only high schools in the country where students can spend their time developing an app to help adolescent cancer patients better communicate with their doctors. They'll be followed by our graduate student winners, Patrick O'Shea and Ann Steptoe from UNC Chapel Hill. They have an innovative idea on how to improve healthcare in rural communities across the state. Think Teach for America for Healthcare Workers. Remember earlier when I described how our students create a sense of optimism about the future, this is what I'm talking about. Thank you all for being here today and for your commitment to this great system and our great state. Thank you. Thank you, President Spellings. We're excited to be here. Um, as she said, my name is Francisco. And I'm Ben. And we are adolescents hoping to help other adolescents on a big health issue that has surely affected almost every one of us. PACT is our digital collaboration tool that works to improve communication among caregiving teams and empowers patients and their families to take a more active role throughout their cancer treatment process. 
PACT will facilitate a means for collaboration between caregivers and patients. Uh, by providing a, a more active role for the patients to play by informing them about their treatment, their treatment will be better and faster than it would normally. Meanwhile, doctors will receive significantly more data points, which is useful and intuitive in the care process. So we will be providing a significantly better use for communication between doctors and caregivers, which will improve quality of life for patients and their family members and the doctors alike. So here's what we'll be covering today. The problem, how we fix it, how we will remain equitable and expand, and the impact we'll have on a vastly expanding market with tremendous social need. Imagine Sophie. She was diagnosed with germ cell cancer in late 2012. Despite receiving the best access to healthcare at UNC hospitals, she passed away in 2013. Sophie was just one of almost 70,000 young adults and adolescents who are diagnosed with cancer every year. On top of their diagnosis, adolescents often fall into an awkward age category between adult and pediatric care, where neither has their resources suitable to their specific age needs, and oftentimes this, promotes, this uh, causes a significant impact on their psychological state and their recovery process. PACT works to give patients a much more active role to play during their treatment process. And the first thing patients will see, for instance, every time they log into our application, will be a slider interface where they can say on a scale of 1 to 10 how they're doing in terms of a number of factors, including anxiety, how um, their appetite has been over the past couple of weeks, how much sleep they've gotten. And all this information that patients provide will provide the contextual information to doctors. And what our application does is it puts this information into a couple of graphs that doctors can easily digest and see immediately in order to make <coughs> more informed treatment decisions. So how will we make money? Well, as Francisco was saying, that we're going to put all the data points that we receive in graphs. And from feedback that we've received from many uh, mentors, teachers, and one of the greatest problems that people have today is taking a lot of data and representing it graphically in the most effective way to understand what it's saying. And that's what we aim to do. We aim to take all of the data that doctors collect now and is represented in the massive spreadsheets that are very hard to understand and represent that data that's collected from the patients directly in a way that they can understand immediately and then go take care of their patients, which will greatly reduce the inefficiencies of the healthcare system today. So originally we had marketed our application towards hospitals, but we've now geared it towards insurance companies because they have access to many more hospitals, patients, and doctors. So through the insurance companies, we'll, we'll, be selling, we'll be marketing the product to them, and then they'll take it to the hospitals that they cover and expand from there. And our beachhead, our beachhead market will be the, the Be Loud Sophie Foundation at the UNC Lineberger system, who has graciously been helping us along the process and given us a way to test our prototype. And after that, we'll, we plan to expand to other adolescent cancer wards and then expand even farther than that to chronic, any chronic condition, really, not necessarily just cancer. And through the application, we'll also be collecting all of the patient data and anonymizing that and then selling it to a pharmaceutical company so that they can, in turn, improve the drugs that they're creating to help the patients and create a feedback loop that will gener generate more stimulation in the healthcare industry. One of the biggest problems that we are hoping to address is the lack of communication or the misunderstandings that occur. And one of our biggest problems that we've had uh, throughout this process has been communicating our ideas since it's been uh, gone through multiple iterations and we've had to refine it. Um, from the very complex idea that it started off with into something that is easily, more easily understood. Um, and um, we're excited to be here. We're ready to take any questions you might have. Any questions? Yes. Where are you in school? Uh, we're at seniors at the North Carolina School of Science and Math. So. Where do you want to go? Uh, <laughs> I'll be at Washington University in St. Louis next year. And I'll be here at Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill, all right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you very much, both. <laughs> very impressive. Good morning. Thank you, President Spellings. Uh, my name is Anne, and my apologies to all of you, but I'm an MD MBA student at Duke currently. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Patrick. I'm a medical student here at UNC Chapel Hill and an MBA student at Duke. Uh, we founded MedServe. It's a two year service learning program in rural and underserved primary care medicine across the state of North Carolina. MedServe provides immediate human capital to low resource areas across North Carolina and also provides mentorship to pre-medical students to launch them into primary care. 
Long term, inspiring pre-medical students to primary care careers saves lives, as each uh, added physician to these communities reduces mortality. I'm a case study in why we actually need a program like MedServe. Uh, after graduating uh, with honors from East Carolina University uh, and teaching eighth grade science through Teach for America and Henderson, I uh, wanted to get my CNA license to work on the front lines of healthcare. I applied to all the local hospitals and uh, didn't hear back. I shadowed for two months before I was eventually hired at a dermatology clinic, actually UNC's dermatology clinic. Um, and that was the only clinic I ever heard back from. I would love to work at a service-oriented clinic, but there simply wasn't a pathway to facilitate that type of connection. And Patrick's experience isn't uncommon, but he found his way to primary care. 88% of our medical school peers don't. And we believe that there needs to be a clearer pathway for service-oriented students like Patrick to get hands-on clinical experience and real mentorship in primary care. And we believe that MedServe <coughs> is just such a pathway. Our model starts with a one-to-one -one match between a recent college graduate and what we call a rock star primary care practice. Our students serve those practices for two years, and there they are active employees getting hands-on clinical experience that they need to apply to medical school. They also get frontline community and public health experience that ignites a passion for service in them further. We support them by training them up front and providing them longitudinal professional development support to get to them to the next step in their higher education. But I think that MedServe impacts communities as much as it does careers. Uh, every MedServe fellow uh, that is added to a clinic means that more patients get seen each week, and they do so with an average 20% improvement in quality metrics over baseline. So we believe our model is highly replicable, not only across geographic area, but also across professions. We've, also, we've already heard from uh, uh, leaders in the dental field and physician's assistant field about how this might be replicable as we, scale, as we look to scale our idea. Uh, we plan to pilot MedServe this summer. We're starting in June of 2016 with 12 uh, students across the state of North Carolina. Most service year programs take two years to start up, but we're starting in one because of the demand. We already have a wait list for clinics to start next year, and in our pilot recruitment phase, uh, we had a 15% acceptance rate of students. We've been fortunate enough to raise over $260,000 thus far from clinics, uh, private philanthropy and other funders, and we're currently working to close the $28,000 gap to fully fund our program. Uh, UNC has been an incredibly robust partner uh, in terms of the administrative support and the fiscal sponsorship from North Carolina AHEC, uh, advisory board members that we have serving from the School of Medicine, um, and uh, our inclusion in UNC's CUBE, uh, Innovator Social Entrepreneurship uh, on, on UNC's campus. I believe that MedServe has the ability not only to shape the lives of its participants, but also of the citizens of North Carolina and the communities in which we serve. Uh, and we appreciate UNC's uh, partnership as we look to fulfill that vision. Thank you so much. Any questions? Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first I was concerned about, you said you couldn't find a CNA program. I thought our community colleges are trained. Is that what you'd said? You couldn't get a, into a CNA program to get trained? No, sir. So I actually did a, a one-day CNA program, huh? um, but it was once I had my CNA license, the gap was then finding a job. I, I, I was probably a little overqualified in terms of a CNA, but in my application process, I, I applied to all the hospitals and I, I didn't hear back. And I probably probably submitted about 20 applications to the various you know units across the hospitals, and I just couldn't hear back. I, I think it, for a variety of different reasons, sometimes it's that next level connection, but it was certainly not on the training piece uh, Good, okay. to start. And, and then just one more, Mr. Chairman. You said that your performance metrics were 20% higher for your participants. Is that because they want to go to medical school or as opposed to just the average person who's providing health services? Did I hear that right? So, no. Uh, okay. And in fact, there are a lot of ways in which our students are less qualified than community members working in practices who've been there for 10 or 15 years. One difference between our students is um, something that, that I think you all know well, and that's the power of young people to be new perspectives and also to be neutral voices. Um, 
as someone who's still a trainee, I found that even my short white coat made people nervous. Um, and, and so coming in as someone who's a recent college graduate, um, who in a couple, in, in many of our cases, actually with the students we've just extended offers to lives down the road and grew up down the road. Um, that's a different dynamic that sometimes produces different information. But really the big reason is that uh, a lot of the quality improvement projects that these clinics have invested in and started because it's the right thing to do for the community are grossly understaffed. So it's not that we're better, it's just that the, there isn't human capital right there to fully fulfill the work that these clinics are set up, setting out to do. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Very impressive. Well, that, we, we need presentations like that from time to time to remind us on days like today why we're here. Exactly. So thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to move now to the consider the administrative action items listed as item seven on today's agenda. Are there any items that board members wish to have removed for discussion? If not, I will entertain a motion to approve the administrative action items by consent. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed aye. like sign. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We will now uh, begin our committee reports with Mr. Davenport for the report of the Audit Committee. Chairman Bissett and Board of Governors members, during its meeting yesterday, the Committee on Audit, Risk Management and Compliance received updates from UNCGA's Chief Audit Officer. In particular, Joyce Bonney, noted that our committed charter, as well as our internal audit charter, needed updates that required approval by the committee and the full board. The committee unanimously endorsed approval of the updates to both the <coughs> committed charter and the internal audit <coughs> charter. Professional standards require that both charters receive periodic review and update as needed. Minor wording changes were as well referenced in the new committee charters. These update documents have been provided to you as a full board for your approval, which you did on the consent agenda. The committee then received an informal presentation on the report deregulation component of the policy review project. Chairman Bissett, this is my report. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Walter. Uh, I'll now call on uh, Mr. Smith for the report of the Committee on Budget and Finance. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I've got a, three items for vote, Mr. Chairman. I did want to make a few comments on uh, century bonds. Um, I think Jane's in here. She picked the, the three words and put in the paper, which is pig and a poe. Um, I will tell you it is not a pig and a poe. It's more like financial engineering. And I think the more we learn about that process, we'll understand it. I, I will also say I got my feelings hurt this morning, Mr. Chairman. We, we had a two-hour committee meeting yesterday, and I worked really hard on century bonds. And it took about an hour. And I walked in this morning, and Hannah said, David Powers took five minutes. Finance and the Board of Governors. Budget and Finance unanimously endorsed the 2016-2017 budget priorities for the short session of the General Assembly. At this time, on behalf of the Committee on Budget and Finance, I move that the Board of Governors approve the 2016-17 budget priorities. You heard the committee's recommendation. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed like sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The committee also unanimously endorsed the 2016 non-appropriated capital projects and associated debt service fees for 2016. Six institutions are requesting approval for 10 capital improvement projects totaling $652 million 
and require an aggregate debt issuance of $538 million. Additionally, four campuses are requesting approval of associated student debt service fees and the elimination of one existing debt service fee. At this time, on behalf of the Committee on Budget and Finance, I move that the Board approve these projects. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Smith. You've heard the Committee's recommendation. Is there any discussion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. It's Marty. Yes, Marty. Um, you know, I, I've said this a few times, but I think it's worth repeating again. Uh, you know, in the last 10 years, we've grown the footprint of the campus 22 million square feet, and we continue to invest very heavily in bricks and mortar. I do think that there's a need to look at that and determine um, overall how much money we need to be investing in this and also projecting out the impact of these new projects on uh, fees as well. Thank you, Marty. Any other discussion? Yes, Mr. Long. I understand what Mr. Curtis is saying. I thought we had a space utilization study, and maybe Ms. Gage, where is she? We did. But are we still using that as a condition for capital projects? Because I haven't heard much about it in the last year. I have to ask Jonathan. I don't know that it's, I think it may be one component of a number. We still use that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Long. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. <laughs> Motion nay. carries. Oh, uh, we got a nay. Uh, we do have a, a nay from uh, from Governor uh, Cotus, but we have to remember he's in Las Vegas and it's very early. So. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. Thanks for joining our meeting. I know it, uh, it is early out there. Okay. After much discussion, the committee also unanimously endorsed the concept of century bonds, bonds having a term of up to 100 years for UNC Chapel Hill and North Carolina State University, subject to ongoing oversight and approval by the board and referred the item to the Board's Public Affairs Committee for consideration and inclusion, inclusion on the Board's 2016 short session policy agenda. Andrea Poole reported on the 2015-16 management flexibility reductions to the committee and the 2015 Appropriations Acts required a reduction of $18,033,112 to be allocated by the Board of Governors. This report was provided to Fiscal Research in the Office of State Budget Management on the due date, April 1st, 2016. Will Johnson reported to the committee that the Connect NC 2016 bond referendum approved by the citizens of North Carolina on March 15, 2016. The bonds fund 21 capital improvement projects at our 17 University of North Carolina institutions, 14 new projects, and seven renovation projects that total $1 billion, $65 million. UNCGA is also working with the Office of State Construction, Fiscal Research Division, and the Office of State Budget Management to coordinate design and construction reviews, funding procedures, and statutory reporting requirements for the Connect NC 2016 capital improvement projects. The committee then received an information report on the policy review project in which the Committee on Budget and Finance will be responsible for policy deregulation in the areas of capital construction, real property, and contracting. Thank you, Chairman Bissett. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Harry. Good report. Um, We'll now call on Mrs. Nelson for the report of the Committee on Educational Planning Policies and Programs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During our meeting yesterday, the Ed Planning Committee received reports from Academic Affairs and the North Carolina AHEC program. In accordance with General Statute 143-613, Dr. Warren Newton, director of the North Carolina AHEC program, gave a presentation of the 2016 biennial update on primary care medical education plans for North Carolina. The committee recommends that these reports be submitted for acceptance and timely submission to the Joint Legislative Education <coughs> Oversight Committee. At this time, on behalf of the committee, I move that the Board of Governors approve this action. Thank you. You've heard the committee's recommendation. Any discussion? 
If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. The committee then heard from Dr. Tim Gallimore, who <coughs> presented proposed amendments to policy 400.4.1, the Sarah exemption from licensure. In January, the board voted to join SARA on behalf of the state of North Carolina. This decision necessitates a change in UNC policy 400.4.1 to accommodate the exemption from licensure provided to out-of-state institutions. <coughs> Upon approval by the Southern Regional Education Board, the SARA exemption from licensure will become effective in North Carolina. The committee recommends that policy 400.4.1 be amended as presented, and it will be on the consent agenda at the next Board of Governors meeting. The committee also heard from Mr. Leslie Boney, who presented a proposed rescission to policy 400.1.4, the UNC Exchange Program. The University Council of International Programs and the Ed Planning Committee Subcommittee on International Programs recommended establishing a new international student recruiting effort for institutions interested in diversifying their student body. Ten campuses joined the new International Student Recruitment Consortium in November. The committee recommends that policy 400.1.4 be repealed to recognize this change. This will be on the consent agenda at the next Board of Governors meeting. UNCGA, in consultation with the campuses, brings recommendations to the Board of Governors for new degree programs that meet identified academic program needs. Appalachian State University requests authorization to establish the following degree programs, a Master of Science in Applied Data Analytics, and a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration in Supply Chain Management. On behalf of the committee, I move that the Board of Governors approve these programs. Thank you. You've heard the committee's recommendation. Any discussion or questions? If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. like sign. <laughs> Motion carries. Thank you. North Carolina A&T State University has completed an academic reorganization and program analysis aimed at enhancing programs and research productivity and fostering sustainable enroll enrollment growth. The process resulted in eight recommendations approved by the A&T Board of Trustees and other related outcomes that require additional approval from the Board of Governors. In accordance with UNC 400.2.1, the Board of Governors must approve any proposals for major reorganization of the administrative structure of the institutions. <clears throat> On behalf of the committee, I move that the Board of Governors approve these actions. You've heard the recommendation. Any questions? Any discussion? If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. like sign. Motion carries. Kate Hen. Hens presented an informational report on UNC undergraduate retention and graduation. UNC institutions meaningfully exceed the national average in retention, four-year, five-year, and six-year graduation rates. System-wide, however, baccalaureate attainment gaps exist between underrepresented minorities and other races, between low-income and high-income students, and between males and females. Lastly, the committee voted to recommend that the board approve the list of licensures and program discontinuations that have been voted on through the board consent agenda. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. This concludes our report. Thank you, Anna. <coughs> now call on Mrs. McNeil uh, for the report on the, of the committee on governance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> the Committee on University Governance has several items for your information and one item for a vote. <coughs> As you have heard and will hear from other committees, the Board is undertaking a policy review project. The Committee on University Governance will act as the steering committee for this project, and the Committee will coordinate technical corrections and updates to the UNC Policy Manual involving other standing committees as appropriate for the subject matter. 
The Committee on University Governance continued its discussion on a possible, possible review of the policy on election procedures and decided at this time to defer the discussion until after the election in May. At the request of Chairman Bissett, uh, the committee held a productive discussion on possible formats and timing for, the, for plans to begin the proposed public comment sessions at the May meeting. UNC Press has a vacancy on its Board of Governors for the completion of a five-year term ending June 30th, 2018, beginning immediately. The Press has, a, has 15 elected members who serve five-year terms and may be re-elected up for up to three full terms. Thirteen of the current members actively hold an academic <coughs> position from the universities, including UNC Chapel Hill, UNC Greensboro, North Carolina State University, North Carolina Central University, and Duke. According to its bylaws, the press, BOG, creates a nominating committee and submits a slate to the chancellor of UNC Chapel Hill, who transmits it to the UNC system president, who presents it to the UNC Board of Governors. We couldn't make it more complicated if we tried. <laughs> Following the recommendation of UNC Press, UNC Chapel Hill Chancellor Fault, and President Spellings, the Governance Committee recommends the appointment of Timothy J. Smith, PhD, Associate Professor of Anthropology, Appalachian State University, to hold this position. Thank you. You've heard the committee's recommendation. Is there any discussion on this candidate? If not, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, <coughs> like sign. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. In addition, as of June 30th, 2016, UNC Press will have three positions on its Board of Governors for, on its Board of Trustees, I think. Board of Governors, okay, for five year terms ending June 30th, 2021. Nominations are requested and should be directed to Ann Maxwell, Board of Governors liaison to the UNC Press. Finally, I want to thank all of you in advance who will be giving greetings at the graduation ceremonies in the coming weeks. They're such wonderful events. I know you all enjoy doing this, and it's very important to the campuses uh, for us to make a, have a presence there. So thank you for signing up so early and filling all the slots. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my report. Thank you, Joan. <coughs> now call on Mr. Powers for the report of the Committee on Public Affairs. And he has, a, he has his UNC Asheville um, suit on today, so I want you to take note. <laughs> no, I don't, don't think that'll be <laughs> I missed that yesterday. If you missed my uh, Bond celebration touchdown dance yesterday. I'm sorry. It will not be repeated today or ever. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Uh, good morning, everyone. You didn't miss a lot. <laughs> Icky Woods was much better at it than I am. Harry, I kind of view it. Do you remember how you somebody hands you a jar to unscrew and you try and try and try and you can't get off and hand it to somebody else and it comes right off and you say, well, I loosened it for you. Yeah, well, so you loosened it for me yesterday as well. I was able to get through the committee. So I was quickly. doing fine until Hannah told me this morning it took powers five minutes. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things I could say to that, but I won't. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, Chairman Bissett and the Board of Governors. President Spellings, during its meeting yesterday, the Committee on Public Affairs voted to adopt new items to the Board of Governors policy agenda for the short session and her reports from the State Government Relations Team. The Committee on Public Affairs approved two additions to the UNC Board of Governors policy agenda, which, we, which was approved at our last <laughs> meeting for the upcoming legislative session. Um, the previously approved list included four items. They're in your packet as a quick reminder, um, eliminating the private fundraising cap, extending the 5% carry forward for the next biennium, <laughs> eliminate the requirement of institutions to use non-general funds for advanced planning for new capital projects, and to, to, to seek a permanent fix for qualified excess benefit arrangement issue. Um, the new items have been debated in other committees and came to us uh, for addition to the official legislative agenda. 
The first addition is to accept the UNC system, North Carolina Community College system recommendation to postpone implementation of NC GAP until various efforts aimed at improving student outcomes from both systems have been measured. The other additions, UNC Chapel Hill and NC State are requesting legislative authority to issue century bonds, which are being utilized across the country to take advantage of historically low borrowing rates. The borrowing will allow the universities to address a significant backlog of deferred maintenance sooner, which will avoid increased costs down the road. The, pop, the revised policy agenda has been provided in your materials today. One thing I do want to make clear on the issue of the century bonds, what we're voting on, what the Budget and Finance Committee passed yesterday was a resolution that stated authorizing the Public Affairs Committee to ask the General Assembly to extend the terms to issue debt to 100 years with the condition these bonds with terms in excess of 30 years return to the Board of Governors for clear guidance on the use of funds and sources for repayment of principal and interest subject to a maximum of $500 million per institution. That is the official uh, resolution that was passed yesterday. What we will be doing is public affairs part of our agenda. What the only move the legislature has to take is actually extending the period of time allowed for borrowing for the university from 30 years to 100 years for those two institutions. That's what we're going to be asking the legislature to do. I just want to make sure everybody understands what, what we're voting on. So at this time, on behalf of the Committee on Public Affairs, I move that the Board of Governors approve these two additions to the UNC policy agenda. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Very well done. Uh, you've heard the committee's recommendation. Any discussion? Champ. Mr. Chairman, I'm the one who made the pig in the poke comment. Um, I should have realized how, how well that would be received. Um, I think these are potentially excellent financing vehicles. Uh, they allow us to lock in an interest rate that has not been seen in even my advanced lifetime uh, and may not be seen in the, in the lifetime of any of you here. However, as with many powerful instruments, they could be abused in powerful ways. And this was the reason for the conditions being put on the resolution. Uh, as originally presented, it was stated that the repayment <clears throat> of this debt might be taken out of tuition. That was totally unacceptable to the majority of us on that committee. We have been fighting to bring tuition and fees under control and hopefully down. And w I would hope we would never approve a century bond where any of it was going to be paid out of the proceeds of monies paid in by the students and their parents. Uh, if you can't find an income stream to support it, then we shouldn't be doing this, burdening people for a century, multiple generations. The second concern that we had was, as presented, we got, and this was the reason for the pig and a poke comment, we got such a potpourri of things it might be used for, some of which were totally inappropriate for the use of what are essentially capital funds, that it became a concern that we were letting loose um, something with no control, a very large amount of money that could, in, in essence, I'm not saying it would be, I don't think it would be, but could be abused could be used for purposes that have nothing to do with long-term, or should have nothing to do with long-term debt. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to just make those comments in order to explain to those who are not in the committee meeting why we put this fence around it. And while Mr. Powers is absolutely right that all we have to ask the legislature to do is change 30 years to 100 years, it may well be, or may not be, that the legislature in their wisdom will decide they need to put some fences around something that could last for that long and burden that many generations. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Chairman. Yes. I'd also Mr. like to Byers. add that, that um, not only is it NC State and UNC, but if there's other qualifying schools, and I understand that it is qualifying, that UNC Charlotte, Appalachian State, East Carolina, any other, this is not seen as just a, a program for you. UNC and NC State, that it is a qualification that must be met, but that the other institutions are also open for that if they so qualify. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of my 
fellow chairman of budget and finance, I've discussed quite a bit in both committees, more so in budget and finance, that uh, we will be looking for ways to involve other campuses, all campuses in some way, shape, or form if possible. We will be looking for ways to involve other campuses in that as we go forward. Be out in the mountains, just want a fair play. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that, on that, Thank the, you, the Phil. current, yes. Rand, Randy made a great point yeah. yesterday. The way it's currently written is each institution has to ride on its own bottom from a debt uh, standpoint. And, and though we understand that, just as this is a policy change from 30 to 100, <laughs> what we are potentially talking about is, and JP and myself and Scott have been trying to figure it out and bring it to the board, uh, is a mechanism where we tie in the other universities and, and, and then have a pool, if you will, that uh, general administration would, uh, would be able to allocate to the schools that don't have the financial resources to ride this on their bottom. And, and we had this same issue uh, this week with Deb at, at Central where Deb had a safety issue and we had to allocate $2 million in emergency bonding to take care of an issue there. The fact is, as, as you spend time on the campuses, you will find every campus we have has significant repair and renovation problems. And as the legislature is very aware of, uh, that grows annually as we have added a tremendous <coughs> amount of brick and mortar to the institution. So we are in the process, as David said, of trying to figure out a mechanism to bring the president, the chairman, and then this board. Thank you, Harry. Uh, yes, Mr. Long. I'm going to clarify something with Mr. Uh, Mitchell. On, uh, we had, had the same concern on the tuition revenue being used to service the debt. My thought was that it would be serviced by a debt service fee just the way we, we pay for all the other debt. Is that what you were thinking? No. Um, a lot of these, uh, the two that we're starting with at least have cash flows that should be sufficient to not require an increased debt service fee. If we go down the road Harry's talking about, <laughs> um, then it might be. But at the present moment, I'm, I am not in favor of increasing either tuition or debt service fee. Now, all of this ha is something that would have to be decided at the time the bonds were issued. We're not trying to decide that today, but you asked me what my position was, and, and that's my position for the two universities that we're talking about today. Okay, Harry. So, uh, Champ's correct. When you look at the two institutions we got, Carol can ride on her bottom with no problem, and, and uh, I don't think you're going to see any uh, tuition increase fees, and, that, and, that was, and that's a great point that was brought to the table. As far as, as Randy goes, I think Randy and those guys have the capabilities too, and NC State's trying to evaluate exactly what they want to do. When it comes to the other ones, there's no debt service fee been discussed at this point. Now, to Champ's point, when we tie the other 15 together, that may be a conversation piece. That's because that we, that uh, they'll be able to pay for it themselves Correct. with their earnings. Yeah, at some point in time, you have to figure out a mechanism <laughs> to take the uh, and, and make whole the campuses on R&R. &R. And there is no mechanism. And, you know, if you take a look, what's our number, 1.3 billion? What's the number? 1.36. Okay, so we got 1.36 billion in R&R, &R, and, and last year we got 50 million. Now, I would argue with you that, that the annual R&R &R needs increase probably that much annually. So we're not taking care of any of the past issues. We're just barely probably keeping it par. So we're trying to figure out a mechanism to get the campuses from an R&R &R issue whole and then a mechanism to keep them whole. And, it, and it's a big issue because it's been bludgeoning over the years and, and there's not been a creative approach to it. If I may, Mr. Chairman, add on to what he's saying. Got this debate going here. Tom, you had your hand up. Do you have anything to say? I do, but I think it's best that the debate finish. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I, it's yeah. not a debate. I just I wanted to add on to, to something that Harry said uh, to make clear. For example, R&R &R is a clearly good use of these funds, and we all know. I mean, I, I'm a Carolina graduate. It embarrasses me to walk around the two main quadrangles of that university and see beautiful Georgian buildings on the exterior boarded up because we don't have the money to repair and renovate them. Okay. That will not necessarily produce an income stream, and that's the point I wanted to make, Steve. All of this isn't going to be paid back by a new income stream. We are 
we are picking the two universities who have the income streams, have the resources where they can do those paybacks, but it won't necessarily come from an income stream off of the buildings themselves or what whatever it's used for. We also could use this for <coughs> capital projects, which ultimately, for example, could be paid for at least in large part out of F and A money. But that won't that's that's not a, an income stream you can count on necessarily in certain circumstances, and it has to be accrued over time. So there's not a simple one-word answer to this, but you should not assume that it will necessarily be off of an income stream related to the expenditure <coughs> of funds. That's the only point I wanted to make. Tom. Mr. Powers, I wanted to make sure I understand. We're, we're being asked to vote on this entire policy agenda, you're telling us there are two additions to it? Actually, we're, the, the, the original four items have been approved. We're asked, we're, our vote will be on the additional two items. Okay, so that's all. It's, it, we're just being asked to vote on the two items, and they are the allow UNC, uh, uh, the, the century bonds. The century and bond then, issue and the uh, delay of the gap program issue. Okay. or the approval of the report of the GAP program. I, I would simply speak on the GAP program. Uh, I support it. Our legislature supports it, passed it overwhelmingly. Uh, I, it addresses the, the dismal graduation rates that we have uh, in many parts of the system. The students that we accept that are doomed for failure, that leave our university system with an incredible debt, and to simply throw it back in the face of the legislature and say, hey, we don't like what you did, instead of addressing some type of reform of some kind, just saying we don't like it and we'll continue to try to figure something out, I don't think that's an answer at all. I think we need to commit ourselves to admitting students to our system who can pass, coming up with a way to make sure that we accept kids who do that. I know the senator who, who really pushed this bill, Senator Curtis, who is extremely concerned about all the children that leave, our young adults that leave our system, Mr. Chairman, that have flunked out, failed, and have a massive debt over their heads, and we have got to do a better job, and simply saying we don't like it is not the answer, and I oppose it. Thank you. I, I, don't, I don't think that's what we're saying. I, I think we're saying, and we're saying that we've just, th this, is a, this is a complicated process. I think we all understand it's the law, uh, and we need to figure out the right way to address it, and I think that the recommendation for a delay came from both the university system and the and the community college system so that so that we can do this right so i don't think we're at least i'm not saying by this vote that i oppose nc gap chairman uh, aren't we studying nc gap i don't disagree with anything that senator governor goolsby said senator governor but but the uh, <laughs> Tom. A good ring. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the question that I have right now is wh where are we in discussions with the legislature on this? I mean, we haven't they actually asked us to look at this and study it? We we were asked to look at it and study it, and I'll ask Junius or somebody that, 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 uh, that. This, could address it a little bit better, and we have done that. So where is Junius? Is he? I'll let you uh, give a better explanation of that. So, oh, as you know, we had several months to put forth the study. In short, you all have it and have seen it. Um, it uses the best of the available data to study the questions. Oh, you want me to go? Yeah. Sorry, I forgot the two questions, two uh, sentences I just said. So I'll go back. <laughs> um, you all have the report from March. We were asked to do the study in quite short order and address questions related to the main goals of NC GAP. What we did was use the best available data and the best available study design and methodology to do that, which was um, consented to in the meeting in PED, which Mr. Powers attended earlier this week. What was recommended in the PED review were a series of things that were challenging, like you know, include private loan data, we don't have that information, so you can't include it. So at the end of the PED meeting, where there was a great deal of discussion, um, the recommendation was made by Representative Fraley, supported by others, 
to have the two system presidents um, sit down and talk together with legislators to determine what should be some good paths forward because there are many sort of unknowns in terms of how you might actually implement. I won't go into the two proposed system implementation methods uh, that were included in the report, but there are a lot of pieces to iron out um, because there are lots of directions the implementation uh, can go. I'm happy to answer additional questions. Does that, does that answer your question? I mean, th th this meeting took place, I think, on Monday. Monday. And uh, I know David was there. I think Jim Holmes was there, along with uh, Representative Fraley and a number of legislators. And they essentially hashed this thing out and came up with this recommendation to get the two presidents together to, to work out any details. So I'm, it, I'm it's, just, it's not we're not saying we're, we're opposing this, because we're certainly not. Right. We're trying to find a way to make it work. That, that was the point that I was going to make when people are voting on this to make sure that everybody understands. We're not saying that the Board of Governors does not agree with the issue. We're just not asking that, and, 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 and it should be noted that the legislature has asked for us to study it. And so as a result of that, postponing it is, the, the vote is on postponing it, not opposing it. And everybody needs to realize that. That's what we're voting on. That's correct. Marty. Marty, are you there? Um, yes, I am. Thank you. Um, I echo uh, a couple of comments by Champ and some um, by um, Tom as well. So FNA and gifts might be a good option for repaying some of these century bonds. You know, I think we keep hearing from students that tuition and fees are becoming unaffordable. Um, you know, the, the nice thing about the Century Bonds, though, is it's a financing mechanism, and it does allow greater bang for the buck. Um, so I think it is a tool that we should have in our arsenal, but it's a, per chance comments, it's a tool that's a, a very powerful tool, and we need to use it very responsibly. Um, in terms of NC Gap, you all know my comments on that. Um, again, that's about college affordability and some steps uh, that we can possibly take to make it easier for someone to get an interim degree and also reduce the cost of um, attending college for those two or three years that they're at the community college system before they transfer in. So one of the big problems I have is I think that we're not identifying the resources that we need to implement NCGAP in our budget, and I think that's a big mistake. I think that we need to uh, provide for those resources in our budget and show the legislature what we need in order to accomplish the existing law. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Marty. Champ? Uh, Mr. Goolsby, um, in our meeting yesterday, um, there was clear acknowledgement. Now, I wanted to make this clear and get it on the record. Uh, the legislature was addressing, trying to address a very real problem the, the problem of graduation rates that aren't high enough, which means we're putting people into school and letting them borrow money and then come out without a degree and not a good way to repay it. They were trying to address the cost of education, which has gotten out of hand uh, and leads to a lot of debt. These are real problems, and, and we agree with and salute the legislature for their degree of concern about these problems. We do think that some of the uh, consequences from NC Gap were ones that were not foreseen clearly and create problems at it, as it is currently written, that it could use some adjustment. But I think most importantly to your point, Mr. Goolsby, and, uh, and it was a point the chairman made, but it's worth reemphasizing, we're not going into the legislature to say, don't do this. Um, and, and just give us more and more time without saying to them, here are things we are specifically going to do to fix this. We understand the legislature is not going to respond positively if we don't come in with some very specific actions that can be taken in a relatively short time to improve the project. We've got to establish our credibility on it. All this was discussed yesterday. It's very important, and I think it's very important that that it be clear to everybody that we are not here criticizing the General Assembly for trying to answer 
real problems. We're trying to find a way to work with them to improve the way we are going to address those problems. But we, we salute them for their concern and their willingness to take action. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Champ. I'd, I'd only add to that, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Champ, that uh, <clears throat> I think that approach is the appropriate one because it is the law. Uh, the General Assembly, you know, I think has made it very clear that they want to see to it that our graduation rates go up, that the failure rate of students who leave our university system with debt that they can't repay is, is not acceptable. To simply say, which I'm glad to hear that we're, we're not saying that, that we just don't like it, just put it off until you go away, that, that's good news. Uh, getting the two system presidents together to discuss how we can make sure that our community colleges are giving transferable credits so that folks can actually do this, that is, if they don't qualify, they get into the guaranteed acceptance program, they take the courses, they get the two years in community college and they transfer. I mean, I think most of the people in the state think that's the way the community college system works right now. And apparently it doesn't. That's a big problem. So us making this a number one priority to fix this problem, I'm glad to see that it's number one on the list. The postponing the implementation, I mean, I, I wish this were worded different so I could support it, that it is our number one priority to make sure that these credits are transferable and that we address the failure rate of students, the long time it takes to graduate, and that we speed all of this up and we do it in very short order. In fact, I think it should be the number one priority of both the community college system and the university system, and it should be something that keeps us all awake at night trying to figure out how to make this happen immediately and not simply put this off. It needs to be done now. It needs to have been done yesterday. This legislation has been on the books here for many, many months now. And I think it should be our number one priority, period. It should already have been done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would agree with Mr. Goolsby on that statement and with some of the things Champ said. And I, I, I'm never one to play place blame, but if we'd been doing our jobs, we wouldn't have had NC gout wouldn't have been necessary to start with. So I don't think we push it down the road for two more years or whatever. I think we take immediate action. I think it is priority one that we take immediate action and that we look in the mirror because we're the reason NC gout had to be passed to start with. Well, there are a lot of good comments there, and I can assure you we are working as hard as we can with the community college system and with the legislature to make this work. But it's, it's not as simply done as you might think. Let me, let me just put it that way. But <coughs> it's our priority. We know it's the law. And we're working very closely. I know uh, John Fraley was at that meeting. In fact, it was his motion as to how we're, we're proceeding, as I understand it. So we're not blocking anything. We're, we're working with our partners at the, at the community college system and the legislature to work this, work this thing out. So the only other thing I would say, and the champ has said it in much more eloquent terms, the century bonds, this is possibly an excellent tool for us and for our campuses. And all we're asking is that the, that the legislature take a look at it and consider extending the term from 30 years to 100 years. Now, the legislature may well put a lot of conditions on that, and, it, and if, it, if it is approved and it comes back to us, I know this board will also put a lot of conditions on any issuance of those bonds. So I, I, I think it's, uh, so, so I'm in favor of this motion. I, I think uh, it can be a great tool for us, as, as has been said. R&R is probably one of our, probably our biggest need in the system right now, and this is a possible uh, solution to some of that. So, anybody else? Steve. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a couple things. On NC Gap, you know, Senator Curtis, I saw him and he asked, you know, how hard is the Board of Governors gonna fight him on NC Gap? Because he's very concerned about the debt levels, of Senator, as Mr. Goolsby mentioned, but, um, 
why do we delay it until 2018 until instead of 2017? I mean, wouldn't we be able to have some alternative or proposal by 2017 rather than 2018? Because this is a two-year delay. So remember the metric of the graduation rate and the phasing in of one intervention of minimum admissions requirements so you can't see the full impact of those. That's just one example of why 2018 was picked. The other thing I'll remind people without getting into a lot of details, there are a number of things the community colleges themselves have implemented just in the last year and some per the PED report um, which are mentioned in their response are still quote unquote under development. So I've been talking to my counterpart there, et cetera, to think through how does one capture the tracking and the outcomes and all of that. The last piece uh, to address Senator Goolsby's comment about transfer credits, all of that is probably going to be working very well because of the 2014 Comprehensive Articulation Agreement. But you need a couple of years to see, because if students started and that was implemented in the middle of 2014, so you really by the end of 2014, you'll start seeing people in there. You need to see at least two years of what the community college students are doing and the transfer of credits, et cetera. Press Steve's. First. Steve's point. Steve, you and I have served together for some time, and I think you know that my patience is legendary. I have none. <laughs> so therefore, I would normally be saying faster, faster, quicker, quicker. The reason it's 2018, Junius has just, just alluded to, even if we come forward today with um, substantial and positive changes, I'm going to use the pig in the poke again. We can't ask the legislature to buy one either. We need to be able to let those get traction, take hold, and let them see and us see whether they work, whether they need adjustment. It, it's like doing a turnaround in a business. You know, I always tried to, to do it as quickly as possible, but it, I never got it done that quickly. And you can't do something like this without a couple of years under your belt to see how it takes hold and if it needs adjustment. So I'd say tw to me, 2018 is actually a tight time frame. And if anybody doesn't understand, that means we need to get moving yesterday then they're missing the point. So, but that's why, and I don't think it's excessive, and I think you and I both know I don't normally have a lot of patience, so there you go. Governor Rippey. Mr. Chairman, I just had one to get a clarification on the 100-year bonds. Can Duke Endowment buy those Chapel Hill bonds? <laughs> <laughs> they certainly can. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I will add, as, as far as the NC GAP stuff goes, we have met our obligations under NC GAP. We have, we, the, the, they, NC GAP called for the university system and the community college system to produce a joint report about implementing NC GAP, which they did. Our board approved that report moving forward. The community college board did not approve that report as written, that their own staff helped put together. So that's where some differences in our approach need to be ironed out, and I think Representative Fraley had a very sensible suggestion at the PED meeting the other day of getting the community college president and the university president together and appropriate staffs and appropriate legislators and ironing out those differences. <laughs> and, and the PED report brought up a lot of unclear you know, uh, issues that need to be addressed on how to track and how to measure and all that. So uh, just getting, getting the, the nuts and bolts accomplished of how this thing will be implemented and Steve, uh, Governor Long, to your point, um, I, I've had many conversations with Senator Curtis, and I want to make sure he understands that we are not opposing him. I'm certainly not opposing him on this. He, he and I have talked many times about university issues, this in particular, that uh, all we want to do is make sure when it's done, it's done right, and as quickly as possible, Governor Goolsby, as quickly as possible, <laughs> to make that happen, but to make sure it's right when it does happen. I mean, that's, to me, another halfway program or another failed program is the worst thing we can do. Getting it right, and moving forward, 
I think, will require a little time. Maybe it won't require the 2018. Maybe we can do it faster. But I'll let President Spellings and President, the new president of the community college system work on that with Representative Fraley and his colleagues to get that right. Thank you, David. Zach. Um, so we've discussed this a lot as student body presidents, and I think we do have uh, mixed opinions on it um, in respect to you know, Governor Mitchell and Governor Goolsby's um, you know, comments. Um, I read a report this morning that $1.2 trillion is the current fee or the current amount for student loan debt, which is um, a third of what our actual government has on hand right now, uh, the federal government for reserve. So I just am hoping that we aren't excluding students from the opportunity to get a four-year education because of a fear of uh, incurring more debt. So that's just my one point I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Bill. Mr. Chairman, when I spoke with Senator Curtis, my understanding was that he believed there was a provable correlation between GPA in high school and the likelihood of success in college. And that was the motivation for NC GAP. The other factors, debt and all of that, certainly plays into that. Juniors, have we looked at any of the other college systems like Texas or Georgia where if you graduate in, one, in the top 10% of your class, you're automatically admitted, and some of those as a response to NC GAP. That is a system that doesn't have some of the downsides that our study pointed out in NC GAP, but also address the question of GPA, admissions, and uh, provable success in college. So we did um, directly and indirectly, and having come from the University of Texas system, from an open access institution that has graduation rates higher than some of ours, it's clear that certainly it can be done and there are improvements to be made. Um, there are two main papers that were cited, one out of Florida and one out of Georgia, where they looked at um, admission requirements, particularly GPA, and looked at what happens Let's say you have a minimum GPA of 2.7, and they looked at the group right there who got in and went to four-year university and the group right below it. And so what happens is the outcomes for that group kind of right below it um, who don't go to the four-year are not good in terms of completing, for example, their two-year degree. So yes, there were a number of things uh, referenced in there. They're also included in the appendices, et cetera. And there are differences, as you know, between the systems. You mentioned Texas where, for example, if you graduate in the top 10% of your high school class, you're automatically admitted to any state institution. So there are nuances. Thank you. John. I think it might be of interest, particularly to some of the newer board members, to um, reiterate what uh, the board did some years ago, and that we're still we're now tracking in raising our admission state uh, standards. So we we have a there has been some response to the idea that um, taking in more qualified students is going to give you a an end result that's more positive. So I, I think may, perhaps some of our members are not familiar with what was done and where we are in that in that process. Any other comments? Yeah, there was one comment. I, I wasn't going to wade into this, but I will. Um, <laughs> you know, ha having had the honor to manage the, the uh, checkbook for two years, it all re relegates back to FTEs, and and this problem exasperates itself <clears throat> in a in a in a in a magnitude way among a couple of our institutions. So, I mean, if you if you if you take and, and look at the 17 campuses, retention rates, graduation rates, it exasperates itself around a couple of our campuses. And understand <laughs> that those campuses are under tremendous pressure to get FTEs, because that's how they get funded, right? So, and, and, that, and there lies part of the problem. And, and the minimum standards that Joan talks about is gonna again challenge those particular institutions. And so we, we've got a problem that, you know, we've got to figure out how to deal with. And the fact is you raise standards, if that impacts their FTEs, you're going to have, you know, funding challenges at some of our universities. 
Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chairman, just one one last thing. Certainly. Um, you know, I, I appreciate Zach being on our board, and I remember his uh, heartfelt remarks about the friend of his who uh, killed himself because of his Attempted student. Attempted to. Pardon? Attempted. Attempted. It just shows the impact, uh, and, and Harry, your point about concerns about who we let in. I mean, the bottom line is we're here to educate people. We're here to let men and women into our system who have a chance. It should not be simply to put students in chairs, but students who can graduate in chairs, who don't show up just to fail and have a mountain of student debt that they can't repay. To the end of uh, Judge Webb's comment about one of, I know, the motivating factors beside, behind Senator Curtis is the 75% graduation rate for students who come into the UNC system who, ha who have a community college degree, who've gone to community college for two years. That was one of the big, uh, big d d factors that really pushed him to want to see the community college be an alternative to the people that don't have a high enough GPA. We're not simply throwing kids out and saying, you don't have a chance in our system. That's what the Guaranteed Acceptance Program is all about. It's a guarantee that if you go to our community college system, you do the two years, you can come into our system, and we know 75% of the time you're going to get a degree. I mean, that's just totally reasonable. If we can get to the end that we can work with the community college system, make sure that those degrees are transferable, that those credits are transferable, and that we can give a guaranteed acceptance program to these young men and women so that we know they get into our system, they graduate, they get a job, they get to be somebody. They're not a debt slave for the rest of their lives. That's the bottom line. Yes, Zach. So, I mean, I agree to, I mean, in that regard, I mean, I've heard from students, um, even offhandedly or, you know, community college students, university students say, hey, Obama's giving out free money. Go ahead and just at least get into college and get the money that you get for that first year and drop out. You know, I've heard that directly. Um, and then in regard to NC Gap, I mean, my sister's a single mother working, and so that would definitely benefit her. But then I still do have reservations with other parts of NC Gap. But I just want to share that. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think it's been a great, uh, great discussion of the issue, not only NC Gap, but um, also the Century Bond issue. Uh, David, I'm going to. Would you like more. me to restate? I'm going to lot more time to you next <laughs> meeting. Would you like me to restate what we're getting ready to vote on? Why don't you do? Because okay. I've got a request from Marty. Okay. Yeah. Mr. This Chairman. jar's tight. <laughs> so, yeah. Mr. Chairman, could we split out? That's what we're going to do. Oh, we well, are. I'm going to talk, talk about that. Okay. Wait, you want to split ahead. them out? Well, I've had a request from Marty to split them out. <laughs> now, I think it's up to this board. I assume Marty's made a motion that uh, he, he'd like to split them out, and I assume Steve will second that motion. And now we'll uh, we can have some discussion and a vote on whether or not we want to split those two out. And, and do remember that the four original items have already been approved, so they're so we're only talking about two. Any? Let, let's just vote on that. I don't well, know. we've do we have we had Marty has made a motion to yeah. split them out. Yes, he has. Yeah. Secretly, but he has. <laughs> oh, he can't. He can't make a motion. He's not. He's not. Physical. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry, Marty. You can't make a motion, and you can't vote. Remember Steve that. Again. I'll make the Steve motion. Steve can make to the split motion. Them out. I'll Bill, second. Bill seconds it. All right, we got a motion, a second. How many people want to split the two up and vote separately on them? Raise your hand. Help me with my counters here. Seven. In. All right, how many would just as soon vote on them together? Motion failed. So we'll vote we'll vote together, but David, if you would okay. if you would so, explain so the motion. Again, what time. we're voting on, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I move that the Board of Governors approve the addition to the policy agenda that will, one, postpone implementation of the NC GAP program until at least 2018 to modify or ensure program meets stated goals of the legislature, and two, allow UNC Chapel Hill and North Carolina State University to issue century bonds. 
under the conditions that were stated. <laughs> under, yes. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Marty. Um, just a quick comment then. In our current budget request, we're asking for $18 million for new programs for innovation intervention strategies to improve completion rates. We're asking for that money and to implement it on short order without having identified exactly how that money will be spent. I'm not sure why, if we can do that, why we can't address the NC gap issues in the same short order. Again, I think we're being somewhat non-responsive by not asking for the resources that we need to implement the NC gap program in our budget. And Thank for you. that reason, if I were there, I'd vote against it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we went into this specific question in great detail in the committee meeting yesterday. I was raising those objections. They were answered. Mr. Cotus, I'm sorry you, you couldn't be there, but I think <laughs> we have covered that. And I'm, I, as one who I, expressed... But I was, Let me finish, there Marty. Was. I, as one who expressed reservations, am satisfied. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have a vote here. All in favor of the... All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay. Let's. Tom, raise your okay. hand. Okay. Ra ra all who voted against it, raise your hand so we can make a note of that. Okay, good. I think that's four and Marty can't vote. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That was a good discussion. I think we all uh, learned a lot. Now, okay. Um, got anything else? No. Well, oh yeah. Unfortunately, I have a few more items oh, right no. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the legislative session right around the corner, the uh, the short session of the legislature comes in a week from Monday night. Um, we did discuss the need to be flexible as other issues come up. Uh, we're sure there'll be some discussion of uh, House Bill Two and impl in implications of that. So uh, if you'll look in your packet, there is a statement in there, does not require your vote, but a statement we put in there for information that says the Board of Governors and the President will continue to provide information regarding HB2's impact on the university and will offer such assistance as the General Assembly may request in considering any adjustments to HB2 that the General Assembly may determine to be appropriate. We wanted to make sure that the General Assembly was aware that we were willing to work with them and, and discuss with them any issues surrounding HB2 and uh, that they saw fit to address. So we, we want to be uh, cooperative in their efforts. The committee also received a report from Vice President of State Government Relations about the current status of interim legislative committees. Interim committees meet when the legislature is not in session and often do a deeper dive on issues that can be, that, than can be accomplished when the legislature is meeting, particularly during short session. Several committees have asked UNC General Administration to give presentations during the interim. The committee also received a report on the Connect NC bond vote, which was held March 15th, as well as an overview of the primary election. Connect NC, which contained over $1 billion for UNC capital projects, received 66% of the vote and won 99 of 100 counties across the state. Significant thanks go to the UNC chancellors and their teams, as well as our own board member, Joan Perry, who was one of the uh, Connect NC leadership team members. Thank you very much, Governor Perry, and thank you so much to the chancellors and your schools. Please give yourselves a big hand. Here, here. As I said, I'll refrain from my recreating the touchdown dance. So, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> thank you for thank that. Thank you very much. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Okay, Mr. Mitchell, report of the Strategic the Special Committee on Strategic Directions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to abbreviate this since I know we're running behind schedule. Um, the strategic, for the moment, strate named Strategic Directions Committee, which will uh, hopefully in a few minutes become the Strategic Planning Committee, met yesterday after uh, some lengthy consulta consultation and idea and information sharing between the President, Chairman Bissett, myself. 
we proposed that a number of things. Number one, that we adopt what is essentially a new strategic plan. Uh, it is past time for us to have revised the existing one. We didn't do it earlier because we had a new president coming on board. We wanted to wait, wait for her. Two, that we make it much more <laughs> focused and specific and actionable and measurable than has been true in the past. But the key thing is focus, limiting the number of priorities and staying right on top of them and, and not allowing the scope to expand. Uh, three, we, we recommend to you, recommended to the committee, they adopted it, and the committee recommends to you a process which will be that a work plan whereby we divide up the five key areas of access, student success, affordability and efficiency, economic impact and excellence and diverse institutions. The five areas identified in the surveys done by the <laughs> BCG group that we split them up among the committees and let the committees uh, do the work and come back to us with their recommended priorities and also that each of these be presented to the full board of governors uh, at one of their meetings over the next few months so we can get input from the whole board. We want input from the board. We want input from the chancellors. The president is going to appoint several of the chancellors to work with each of the committees. Um, we also want it from the rest of the university community and we want it from the general public and the legislature. And, and uh, Representative Fraley suggested that we meet with the speaker and the president pro tem and, and get some of the legislators or their staffs involved on these various committees, which is a wonderful idea. And we ha happily accepted his offer of facilitating those meetings. Um, at the end of the day, we will put this together into a single plan and bring it back to the board, but it will be much shorter than the current plan <coughs> is and much more focused. Um, there's a lot more that can be said about it. In your packet for today, you have a resolution, a draft of a resolution that sets forth the process that we intend to go through and the new charter of the newly named Strategic Planning Committee. And the committee has recommended this to you. The one other thing I will say uh, about this before I ask you for a vote, Mr. Chairman, is, by the way, it's a, it's a document done because we're so green, so you need to flip on the back page, too. Um, Charlie had to point that out to me. I thought we left something out. Uh, the last sentence on the back page is, once the plan is approved by the board, the committee shall monitor the progress on the achievement of its priorities and implementing actions. That's not just empty words. We know in advance that if we come out with 20 priorities to do in the next 18 months to two years, the tendency will be for those to be expanded, for little projects to be added under them, the scope to creep out. I, I suggested to the chairman that actually that since our function is to be sure we keep focus and we keep scope corralled, that we probably should rename this the Nancy Reagan Memorial Just Say No Committee. And that is going to be our job. Mr. Chairman, the resolution is before the members of the Board of Government uh, Governors. It is submitted by the Strategic Directions Committee, and I ask for a vote. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, this is going to be, if, if it passes, which I assume it is, it's going to be a very important priority of this board for the next six months. And so, and there's, and there's going to be some, some heavy lifting involved with it. So uh, I appreciate uh, Champ and, and all the members of that committee uh, who, who will be uh, directing this process. Uh, you've all heard the committee's recommendation. Any discussion? What? Come on now. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Stop. Stop. <laughs> yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Motion <laughs> carried. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, the last thing I will say is to reiterate what you said. I was saving the best till the end. 
we're not going to spend a lot of time. We're going to spend a lot of time. We're not going to let a lot of calendar days run getting here. We have a long legislative session that really starts the work towards the end of this year um, as soon as the short one's over pretty much. So we've got to get this done to set our strategic priorities for the long session. Therefore, we're going to get it done by the end of the year. My commitment is to try to shrink it down, but that means a lot of work, as the chairman has just said, a whole lot of work in a short period of time. We ask all of your cooperation and your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, champ. Uh, Zach has one comment. Yeah, short I just wanted details. to make it will be short. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Mitchell and you know the board for letting me serve on that committee. I think it's a really important position for the student to have, the student member to have. Uh, so I just want to extend my gratitude for being a part of it um, this year. I know that's the first time that's really happened. So it is a really good positive step. So thanks. And, and having Zach on there has been a real gift because he has brought us a perspective that had been missing in the past. Unfortunately, yesterday he wasn't there because he was up straightening out the United Nations. So I'm really <laughs> pleased that our next generation has taken hold of that organization. It may be more messed up than we are. Thank you. Oh my yes. <laughs> okay. Finally, we get to the chairman's report. Now we're now we're here for the fun stuff. Now, number one, I want to uh, wish uh, Governor. Burris Floyd, a happy birthday. She tells me she celebrated her 27th birthday yesterday. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, several of us sang happy birthday to her in the restaurant last night. Oh, very good. Very <laughs> to good. our great embarrassment and the irritation of everybody in the restaurant, we can't carry a tune between the hours. <laughs> well, we won't proceed with that today since you've already had the the uh, song, so we won't do it. The, the second thing I wanted to do was con congratulate um, Zito and Robin uh, again. Uh, for those of you who made the installations, they were they were incredible events, and uh, it was a beautiful day in in Wilmington outside on the lawn, and uh, uh, just a, a, a very fine uh, installation event. And then Robin's in Pembroke. Uh, it's obvious that we have uh, found the person there that that community loves and that loves that community, and uh, I'm very excited about both of their terms as, as they begin, so it was great. I do want to thank you. I want to echo David's uh, comments on the bond victory. Um, I, if, he, if he had done his victory dance up here, I was going to do the happy dance, but since he didn't, you, told me. you don't have to bear, you don't have to go through that. Uh, I want to congratulate Margaret on her world tour. I've, I've followed her around the state, and I mean, it's, it's an amazing uh, job she's, she's taken on there, and, and, and really the, uh, the reaction from all of our campuses has been, been excellent. So thank you, Margaret. And finally, well, not quite finally, but the, uh, the Watson College of Education at UNC Wilmington annually gives some awards called the Razor Walker Awards to those individuals whose vision, tenacity, courage, and sacrifice have made a difference in the lives of young people. And one of those awards this year is going to our own Hannah Gage. So, okay. Finally, well, that's that, uh, that, <laughs> that's, good. that's good. I can't think of anybody who would be more deserving of that reward. <coughs> Finally, the next meeting of our Board of Governors is scheduled for Friday, May the 28th, here in the boardroom. Uh, there are a number of events scheduled around the board meeting, including the Staff Assembly's Golf Tournament. And there is a uh, flyer in your uh, package. And I, I know we've corresponded on this from time to time. I've gotten some response, but not nearly enough. And uh, as you know, the purpose 
of this golf tournament is to provide funds for the Janet B. Royster Memorial Staff Scholarship Fund. And on, on your flyer here, please note, there is a place that tells you how to make your checks payable and where to send them. So let's, uh, let's do what, what you can. It's a very important uh, uh, event and program every year, and, um, and we've always supported it uh, uh, <coughs> to the hilt, and I hope we'll be able to do that again this year. Uh, finally, and finally, the university award banquet uh, will also uh, be held during our next meeting in May. So be on the lookout for more information coming your way about that. And what? You want something else to say? Oh, I'm sorry, Elwood. I didn't see you back there. Yes. Uh oh. Uh oh. I think he's out of order, but we'll. I just wanted to say that the the <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor Earl. There was, there was one more thing that uh, um, I wanted to pass your way because, in addition to receiving a wonderful award, Governor Cage is also celebrating her birthday. Today. Oh. 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 Okay. The singing governors will gather. <laughs> <laughs> Tax day. Let's do that in yeah. closed session, so it'll be. We'll gather outside. To do that. <laughs> <laughs> One thing we found out for a guy who talks so much, champ cannot sing. <laughs> Henry, that's good. Okay, see, I told you the chairman's report would be good. Now, uh, I'll entertain a motion, Secretary Perry, to uh, move into closed session. Do I have to sing it? <laughs> no, 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 no. I move that we go into closed session to prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential pursuant to the law of this state or the United States or not considered a public record within the meaning of Chapter 132 of the General Statutes. Prevent the premature disclosure of an honorary award or scholarship. Consult with our attorney to protect the attorney-client privilege. Establish or instruct staff or agents concerning the negotiations of the amount of compensation for the contract. Ma'am, see you soon. Oh, you guys are great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Or employee or prospective public officer employee pursuant to Chapter 143 through 
Okay, we're back in uh, open session, and I recognize Mr. Pickett for the report, the Committee on Personnel and Tenure. Chairman Bissett and Board of Governors members, during its meeting yesterday, the Committee on Personnel and Tenure received brief updates from both academic affairs and human resources. Dr. Gonzalez mentioned that Kimberly Van Nort, the newly appointed Vice President for Academic Programs and Instructional Strategy, will join General Administration on April 29, 2016. Mr. Brody mentioned that a working group on faculty salaries has been convened. The working group is comprised of general administration staff from human resources, finance, and institutional research, and is in follow-up to earlier discussions on this topic with the committee. The working group is reviewing faculty salary data from multiple sources and carefully considering the pros and cons of each data set to determine the most appropriate approach to conducting our analysis. The staff expects to return to the committee this summer with an initial work product from this effort for the board's consideration. The committee then received an informational report on personnel actions delegated to the president. Following that, Mr. Brody introduced a wide-ranging policy review project being undertaken by several board committees. In particular, the Committee on Personnel and Tenure will review proposals to increase the President's delegation on several HR-related matters. The Committee expects to begin to review policy recommendations for the President on this matter at the May meeting. Mr. Brody then presented a high-level summary of the 2016-2017 EHRA annual raise process. The process was finalized in December and made retroactive to July 1, 2015. This year's ARP was funded solely by campus resources and was largely designated both to reward EHRA employees for meritorious performance and also to retain key personnel. The report showed that 52.89% of the system's EHRA population received an annual review process related increase. The sum of the total increases was $34,737,528, representing an average increase per person of $2,976, or 3.62% increase over the employee's June 30, 2015 salary. Finally, the committee reviewed a resolution to delegate authority to the UNC Healthcare System Board with final approval by President Spellings for certain employment matters related to the current CEO of the healthcare system, Dr. William Roper. Specifically, the resolution empowers the UNC Healthcare System to negotiate and extend the employment contract for Dr. Roper through 2020 and provides authority to the President to execute the employment contract on behalf of the university. The committee approved recommending this resolution to the board for approval as part of today's consent agenda. The committee separately indicated interest in having future discussions about its role and responsibilities with regards to total compensation decisions of the university's top executives. Thank you, Chairman Bissett. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Terrence. Zach, did you have one last thing? <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to uh, bring up, I guess, the golf tournament that is coming up. And um, I think it would be great if students could participate in that. Um, a lot of times I know those things are seen as, you know, fun on the side. But, I mean, those are integral parts of, you know, bonding and building relationships with the board. I mean, we've experienced that within ASG taking retreats. And uh, if there's any way possible, I mean, we'd really appreciate that opportunity. You want to play, Zach? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I, I don't know about my golf skills, but I'll, I'll try. You won't beat Winston-Salem State, I can tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care if you're a pro, you won't beat Winston-Salem State. The person you talk to, Zach, is Cornell. Do it. Yeah. Okay. And we'll work something out. Yeah. We'll work something out also, there. Lou, um, yes. There's a cell phone found out on the patio, and it's been turned in at the front desk. Okay. Sure Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Marty, are you still with us? 
I am. Well, go down to the casino <laughs> and try to win some money. All right, I'll enter. Oh, I'm sorry, Just Laura. real quick, uh, Zach had an interesting experience, I guess, in the past week, and, and sometimes we don't know when we find young men to get involved in. Could you tell us anything about <laughs> Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Um, so Monday I left for the United Nations. I was uh, chosen as part of eight, nine students to go. Um, we had the opportunity since uh, a faculty member at NC State was invited to come and give advice on the uh, Security Council. So we were actually able to sit into a Security Council meeting, which is like really, really rare, especially for students. Um, but it did have the academic outreach component. It was about uh, nuclear nonproliferation. Um, we also met with the South Korean uh, ambassador. Um, among many other officials. So, I mean, it was a great, great trip. So that's why I wasn't here Thursday. I but, you I, yeah, I woke up. At, I mean, our flight got delayed, and so I haven't slept. But uh, I drove straight here from 4 o'clock. So, Good. yeah. Uh, thanks for making it today. Of course. And, uh, I, I know that was a great experience. It was. So thanks for sharing that with yeah. us. All right. I hear a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Yeah. All in favor. Yeah. See you in right. May. Just hate it when you go. <laughs>